welcome. Thank you for joining with me today in our study of the Word of God. Today we are concluding our eight-part series entitled The Seven Churches of Revelation. Today's study is the church in Laodicea. Take your Bible. I hope you have your Bible with you today. Please take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. I have my Gatorade, and I want to talk about an illustration a little bit later. I want to talk about the danger of being a lukewarm church. And I have my clock. Do you see what time it is? Five minutes to midnight. I believe time is short. We are living in the last days. No, not the end times. The end times start with the rapture of the church. We are living in the last days. The coming of the Lord is near, and this will serve to remind us that Jesus could come at any moment. Are you ready for the midnight hour? Okay, we're going to ask three questions uh, when we study the church in Laodicea. Number one, what is Jesus saying to the church in Laodicea? Number two, what is Jesus saying to us? And then my last question tonight is what can we learn from all seven churches? Are you ready to read the Word of God? Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen. Did you hear what I said? Let me read it again. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Verse 17, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Verse 19, those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask for your Holy Spirit to speak. Speak, Lord, to the hearts of the people today. Lord, let it not be my words or my opinion. I pray in Jesus' name that your word would go forth. You'd touch every heart. You'd touch every mind. You'd move across every soul, every person watching me today. I pray in Jesus' name you would speak life, encouragement, increase our faith. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's look at five things we can learn from the church in Laodicea. Number one, where is Laodicea? Let me put up our map of the seven churches in Revelation. You can see the island of Patmos from where John is writing. And then we go in a circle to the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and tonight our last church, Laodicea. Laodicea was an ancient city built on the river Lysus. Here are some pictures of its ruins that uh, you may one day would like to visit. Laodicea is named after the city's founder's wife. Her name was Laodice. 
and the city was very wealthy. The, city, the citizens of Laodicea made advancements in science and literature, and the city had a renowned medical school. The city was well-placed along trade routes, and its citizens enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle. They were in need of nothing, which is why Jesus calls them out on their dependence on wealth. You remember what we just read? Revelation 3.17, Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. And so Jesus here calls them out on their dependence on wealth. What is Jesus saying about the church in Laodicea? They were outwardly wealthy, but they were spiritually bankrupt. Church, I want you to know of all the seven churches we are studying in this series, it's the church in Laodicea that seems to relate best and most to the church of the current age in the Western world. And so this is a very important church that we need to pay attention to because I believe Jesus' words of correction and discipline to the church in Laodicea are very applicable to the church today. Laodicea also had a large Jewish community of whom many of them became born-again Christians and followers of Jesus. In fact, when Paul wrote his epistle to the Colossians, Paul also made sure that it was read publicly to the believers in Laodicea. Paul in Colossians mentions the church in Laodicea, just 11 kilometers away from Colossae. He, he mentions the church in Laodicea four times. Let me give you a couple of examples. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says to the church in Colossae, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those in Laodicea. Look what he says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read to the church of the Laodiceans. And I want you to know that the church in Laodicea, even though Jesus rebuked the church and disciplined the church, I believe they, they repented and they got on the right track. And I believe that this church persevered through the generations. In fact, a few centuries later, in 363 AD, the city of Laodicea held a very important church convention. It's called the Council of Laodicea. And over 30 pastors and church leaders from across Asia Minor gathered together to work out the doctrines of the church. And this Council of Laodicea discussed the very these uh, issues. Let me show them to you how relevant these issues are even today. What did this Council of Laodicea discuss way back in 363 AD? Let me just share them quickly. Number one, how to handle issues of modesty in the church. Number two, how to deal with false teachers. Number three, how to deal with Jewish leaders who try and persuade Christians to go back under the law of Moses. Number four, they also discussed that the Saturday Sabbath should be outlawed and Sunday as a day of rest and worship is to be encouraged. Interesting. They also, number five, they also determined the best curriculum to teach their children about Jesus. Now, they probably had kids' church. Number six, very interesting, they condemned astrology as a false teaching. So people were going after their horoscopes and looking at how to project uh, 
their, their life and their future, and the church said no to this. And number seven, the Council of Laodicea also worked on the Bible, determining which books are inspired and which books don't belong in the Bible. And there were some that were not allowed in the Bible because they believed they were not inspired by the Holy Spirit. And in later councils, this was further ironed out. So very interesting, the Council of Laodicea in 363 AD. So that demonstrates to me that the church that Jesus corrected in Revelation 3, I believe they must have persevered, kept going. They made corrections. They humbled themselves. They, they worked and served together to take a leadership position in future generations. Well, if we go farther ahead into history, in 13 in the 1300s, the city of Laodicea was destroyed by the invasion of the Turks, and so the city lays in ruins today. Okay, do you have some background information? Are you still with me? Let's keep going. Number two, who is speaking to the church in Laodicea? Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen. Oh, I like this. The faithful witness, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus is given a very interesting and unique title here. I want you to see it. I want you to notice it. Do you see it? Jesus is the Amen. Now, I've never personally used this title when referring to Jesus. But I've discovered personally, when studying end times prophecy, I have learned some new titles to, to uh, that, uh, new titles to add to my prayer life. I've learned that Jesus is the smiting stone. Jesus is the ancient of days. And here in Revelation chapter 3, I like this church, I like this, Jesus is the Amen. What does it mean that, it, that Jesus is the Amen? Well, let's look at this quickly. What does Amen mean? We say Amen at the end of our prayers. Amen is a Hebrew word. What does it mean? Come on, you know what it means. So be it, or let it be so. In fact, amen is a word used to express a solemn ratification or to confirm what has been said. And this word amen is all over the Bible. In fact, 76 times it's used in the word of God. Let me, let me ask you a, a couple of trivia questions today. Can you guess which book in the Old Testament uses the word amen the most? It's the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, why? Because it lays out specifics of God's covenant with the people. And these covenant laws ended with the people's response. What did they say? Amen. Come on, let's look at one example. There's many, but let's look, just take one. Deuteronomy 27, 15. This is part of the covenant, and these are the laws of the, you know, the blessings and the curses. Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Let it be so. Confirmed by the people. So, the word amen was used to ratify the laws of the covenant as a declaration of agreement. Now, let me ask you this. Which book in the New Testament uses the word amen the most? Can you guess? Certainly, Jesus uses amen when he leads us in the Lord's Prayer. Certainly, Paul ends every single one of his general epistles or letters with the word amen. Amen. But the, the, the book in the New Testament that uses the word amen the most is Revelation. Isn't that appropriate? 
I'm sure that's appropriate. The last word, amen. The Revelation is the last book of the Bible, and it deals with the last things, often using the word amen to confirm the coming of the kingdom of God. Let me give you a quick example. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. And so we learn here in Jesus' message to the church in Laodicea that he himself is the amen. Now let me say it again. Church, Jesus is the amen. Well, I just think you need to add this to your prayer life and how you pray. If Jesus is himself the amen, this means that Jesus himself is the ratification and the confirmation of the promises of God. Now, can you say amen to that? Look what 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, let me keep that verse up for a second. What's the most important words in, these verse, in this verse? In him. Do you see that? In him. In him. In who? In Christ. The promises of God are all fulfilled in Christ. The promises of God are in Christ and of Christ and through Christ. Church, Jesus is the one who carries out and fulfills all of God's promises. God promised to love you. This promise was fulfilled in Christ. Jesus is the amen. God promised to redeem you. This promise was fulfilled in Christ. Amen. God promised to cleanse you. This promise was fulfilled in Christ. Somebody say amen. God promised to adopt you. This promise was fulfilled in Christ. Amen. God promised to empower you. This promise was fulfilled in Christ. Amen. God promised to sanctify you. This promise was fulfilled in Christ. Amen. Glory to God. God promised to return for you. Hallelujah. This promise will be fulfilled in Christ. Amen. Church, I want you to know Jesus is the amen. Jesus is the last word. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise. Jesus is the ratification of the covenant. When Jesus said on the cross, it is what? It is what? It is finished. The work of reconciliation, the work of redemption is complete. Amen. So church, I want you to do something today. I want you to use this phrase, Jesus is the amen. I want you to use this phrase the next time you pray. Just declare it as a word of praise. Jesus, you are the amen. You are the alpha and the omega. You're the beginning and the end. Jesus, you have the last word. Jesus, you are the last word. Jesus, you are the amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Why don't you pray like that? Pray a prayer like that. I want you to know, can I encourage you today? Let me just encourage the people of God for a moment. Church, Jesus has the last word over your situation. Jesus has the last word over your family. Jesus has the last word over your destiny. Church, Jesus is the amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you thankful that Jesus has the last word? The enemy is defeated by the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus has the last word. Glory to God. I hope you've already learned something today. Okay, let's keep going. I want to keep going. For what things does Jesus commend the Laodicean believers? Well, like the church in Sardis. Remember the church in Sardis? Jesus didn't have anything good to say about the church in Sardis. And the church in Laodicea isn't much better. Jesus has very little good to say about the church in Laodicea. In fact, 
Jesus speaks to the church in a disciplinary manner. He speaks as a father speaks to a misbehaving child. What does he say to the church in Laodicea? Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. And although Jesus' words are harsh, they are spoken out of great love. Church, I want you to, do you remember when you were disciplined by your parents? I can remember as a child, I recall my father's discipline. His words cut deep into my soul. When he said he was disappointed with me, it hurt me. It caused me to be humbled, to make corrections, to to change the way I was behaving. It wasn't pleasant at the time, but the lesson was learned. Why? It was for my good. And my father's correction was because of his love for me. I, w- I was reminded of Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Church, can I encourage you today? Do not despise the Lord's discipline. What does this mean? Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Don't neglect the Word of God. Don't disregard your spiritual elders in the Lord, people you look up to. Let them speak into your life. Let them give you direction and advice in how you should walk. Church, the reality is, Sometimes we all need a course correction, or we all need a spiritual realignment, or we just plain need to be humbled. Hello? I'm reminded in my own life, church, if I don't humble myself, somebody will do it for me. Lord, help me to walk in humility in Jesus' name. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed, hello, by taking heed according to your word. So Jesus speaks as a father to a child, the Laodicean church, and they are misbehaving. They are out of alignment. They need a course correction. Ah, even more, they need to be humbled. Here we go. Number four. Are you still with me? Number four. What things does Jesus admonish the Laodicean believers? Let's look at it right away. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, speaking of righteousness, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Okay, let's get right to the point. I want you to see this. Jesus has two major problems with the Laodicean believers. What are they? Number one, they are lukewarm in their work. Okay? In their work. Jesus says, I know your deeds. And then he speaks that they are lukewarm. So I want you to catch this. They're lukewarm in their work. Number two, they are self-sufficient in their faith. The Laodicean church, I said this before, don't miss this. In my opinion, as I read about the Laodicean church, is the church most like today's modern church? Two words, remember what they are? Lukewarm and self-sufficient. Lukewarm, self-sufficient. Church, don't miss this. Lukewarm, self-sufficient. Catch those two words, and I want you to uh, 
Be reflective about these two words in your own life and in your own church. What are these two words? Don't miss it. Hear it again. Catch it. I want you to have it in your heart. Lukewarm, self-sufficient. These are the two problems. Now, let's talk about this lukewarmness. What is Jesus saying? I wish you were either hot or cold. Now, why does Jesus say this? Well, it's very simple. Cold water is refreshing. Hot water is useful for medicinal purposes, for food preparation, for all kinds of other things. But lukewarm water is useless. It's not good for anything. Have you ever needed a refreshing glass of cold water, but all you got was lukewarm water? Well, I have my Gatorade. I remember, it's been a few years now, but I can remember running a 10-kilometer race in one of the hottest days of the year. I don't know if it was July or August, but it was in Scarborough, and it was... Uh, hot day, even early 7 a.m. in the morning, it was already very hot. And I ran this 10K race and crossed, crossed the finish line, and I was absolutely uh, in need of refreshment. And I can still remember someone handed me a lukewarm bottle of Gatorade. And I couldn't even bring it to my mouth. I could, as I tasted it, I wanted to spit it back out. I needed to be refreshed. This lukewarm liquid was useless to me. It had no purpose. In fact, it made me want to spit it back out. I want you to know that Jesus says the works of the Laodicean church, the works were like lukewarm water. Totally useless. It made Jesus want to vomit the believers out of his mouth. This is very vivid, almost shocking uh, terms. The Lord, listen to me, the Lord rejects half-hearted efforts of self-satisfied Christians. And, and I see this in the Western church. I see it today. Where do I see this the most? Listen, I don't have to look far. Many Christians today in this world, they will make Sunday morning church a priority. They'll come to church on Sunday. But when asked to do something beyond the Sunday morning service, the numbers will drop way down. You call a special service, numbers go down 60%. Have a Bible study, numbers will drop 70%. Call a prayer meeting, numbers will go down 80%. Have a, how about an outreach meeting or a ministry meeting? The numbers will drop by 90%. Now, is this just your church? Is it just my church? Not at all. This is the Canadian church. This is the Western church. What does this say to us? Most Christians are lukewarm in their works. Now, church, I want you to I want you to know something. I believe the fault lies with leadership. I believe that the church has created here's the words, don't miss this. I believe the church has created a consumer culture to try and grow their attendance. Instead of reaching the lost, the church wants to reach other Christians. And they create a consumer culture with a high priority on creating an experience for people. Are you still listening to me today? They place a high priority on creating an experience, an experience with music, an experience with preaching, an experience with programs, an experience with special events. These are not wrong in and of themselves. But the danger is if the church creates a consumer culture to try and reach not the lost, but other Christians by giving them a particular experience that they would enjoy. Listen, the church today places a high priority on experience, but Jesus places a high priority on obedience. 
Did you just hear what I said? Christians are running here and there looking for an experience. But few people are looking for obedience. What am I talking about? Is there anyone out there that that is saying, that's crying out today, how can I become more like Christ? How can I lead a holy life? How can I serve others better? Church, listen, we've cre- the church has created a consumer culture we, by creating an experience. Jesus places a high priority on, no, no, on not experience, on obedience. Now listen to me. I believe that in the midst of COVID-19, yes, this is a difficult season. Yes, we're in a time of adversity. Yes, there's trouble all around. But in the season of crisis, there also comes opportunities. And I believe that COVID-19 has created an opportunity for the church to reassess what's important. Instead of placing a high priority on experience, we need to place a high priority on obedience. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 21, 12 and 13. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out, that's a key word there, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of what? A house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Listen to me, people of God. I believe we need another house cleaning in the house of God. Can I say it again? We need another house cleaning in the house of God. We need to overturn a consumer culture. We need to overturn an experience-driven church. And we need to become an obedience-driven church. Can I get an amen from somebody? Well, have you done any spring cleaning around your house yet? I believe as you do spring cleaning in your house, we also need to do spring cleaning in the house of God. We need to clean out the clutter and we need to create more room for the Holy Spirit. Church, we have to get back to obedience. Luke 10, 27, Jesus says, you shall love. The Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. What is Jesus talking about? Love for God, love for others. Love for God, love for others. This is not about experience. This is about obedience. And so Jesus has these two major problems with the Laodicean believers. Come on, what are they? Number one, they are lukewarm in their work. They are self-sufficient in their faith. How can you and I address these two problems in our life? I think it's very simple. We don't have to make it complicated. Listen, you don't need a degree to understand this. Let's keep it just practical and simple. How can we address these two problems when they come up in our lives? Lukewarm and self-sufficient. Here's two questions to speak to this. Number one, are you serving others? And number two, are you coming to the altar? I believe these are critical questions, very simply put. Let me put it this way. Are you giving of yourself and are you meeting with God? I believe this is critical that we understand we have these two temptations to become lukewarm in our work and self-sufficient in our faith. How do we combat these two problems? Church, we got to serve others and we got to come to the altar. We got to give of ourselves and we have to meet with God. The church in Laodicea was lukewarm. What does Jesus say? You're useless. They were, this church in Laodicea, 
Jesus says they're useless. Why? Because they were religious. They were legalistic. They were concerned with appearances and reputation. What does God want? He wants the church to be useful. It's not about reputation and religiosity and legalism. It's about loving God and loving others. Loving God and loving others. Church, are you loving God? And are you loving others? Hmm. Are you serving others and coming to the altar? Are you giving of yourself and are you meeting with God? I believe this is the call for effectiveness in our walk with God. Okay, let's keep going. Are you still with me today? Are you learning something tonight? Last point, number five, what is the Spirit saying to us? Look at this with me, Revelation 3, 19 and 20. Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, I know you've heard this verse many times, but let's look at it again for the very first time. Church, look at this verse with me. Have I know you've heard this verse before, but I have to confess it's been taken out of context. I have taken this verse out of context. I'm only seeing it now in a new way. Whenever we've read this verse, we think about this verse, we think this verse is about Christ standing at the door of the heart of an unbeliever, knocking so that the unbeliever would open the door and invite Christ into their heart. But church, this verse is not about that at all. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? If we look at this verse in its proper context, this verse is about Jesus standing at the door of his own church. Jesus is standing at the door of the church in Laodicea, knocking. And he says, if anyone will let me in to his own church, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door of my own church, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Church, I want you to see something. I want you to see it maybe for the first time. Jesus is standing at the door of his own church on a Sunday morning. And what's he doing? Knocking, knocking, knocking. If there's anyone in the church who hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to my church. What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying to the church in Laodicea? What is he saying to our church? You can have church, but you can leave me out in the cold. What is Jesus saying? You can have religion, but miss me altogether. You can have your songs, but not my presence. You can have your preaching, but not my word. You can have all your prayers, but not my power. You can have all your agenda, but not my anointing, because you've left me out of the building. You've left me out of your heart. You've left me standing at the door. Can I ask you a question? Is Jesus allowed in your church? Or is he just an inconvenience? Maybe he won't fit into our nicely packed agenda of religious things. We only have 75 minutes to perform our religious duty. Is Jesus really allowed into the church? What is the Spirit saying to the churches? Hear it again. Listen to what Jesus says. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is not talking about an unbeliever. 
Jesus is talking to the church. And Jesus is knocking at the door of the church. Is anyone listening? Can you hear him? He's knocking. But maybe we can't hear him over all our religious duties and rituals. Maybe we can't hear him over all our agendas and, and all our activities. Church, Jesus is knocking on the door of his own house. Wow. Wow. Will someone let Jesus into his own house? Wait a minute. Did you just catch that? It's his own house that he's been shut out of. Now listen, have you ever been locked out of your own house? It's actually kind of embarrassing. It happened to me just a couple of years ago where I, I locked the door uh, and I was Suddenly, I had to get back in and realized I left my keys in the house. I had been locked out of my own home. I went around and checked if there was any open windows, and there was nothing open. I had to call Renee until she came hours later to bring a spare key so I could get back into my own home. It's really an embarrassing situation. Church? Jesus has been shut out of his own home. Let me ask you a question today. What would happen if Jesus is allowed back into his own house? What would happen? Whew, what a question. What would happen if Jesus is allowed back into his own house? Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me just tell you quickly what this means. Listen, I'm almost done. Let me tell you what this means. What Jesus has done in the past, he will do again. If Jesus is allowed into his own house, Jesus will save the sinner. Jesus will heal the sick, cleanse the leper, open blinded eyes, Cast out demons, raise the dead, set the captives free. Church, I believe it's time we invite Jesus into his church. He says it out loud to the church in Laodicea. If anyone in there, if anyone in there, if anyone in the church hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Church, let's invite Jesus into his own house. Okay, let's conclude very quickly. What can we learn from all seven churches? My last point today. What can we learn from all seven churches? In the seven letters, Jesus warns that the church must guard against six things. Number one, we can lose our first love. Number two, we can have a fear of persecution. Number three, we can compromise on doctrine. Number four, we can compromise on morality. Number five, we can become spiritually dead. Number six, we can become lukewarm and self-sufficient. These are all the dangers that are highlighted and outlined in all these seven churches. I want you to know something. There's one solution that uh, keeps repeating over and over and over. Jesus tells the churches to what? Repent. Over and over again. To the church in Ephesus, repent and do the first works. To the church in Pergamum, repent or I'll come quickly to you. To the church in Thyatira, unless you repent. To the church in Sardis, hold fast and repent. To the church in Laodicea, Jesus says, repent. It's only in the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia where Jesus commends them for their perseverance. I, I want you to know, repentance, this word repentance, is one of the main messages to the church. Church, listen to me. If we want to get back on track, if we want to be aligned with the Word of God and aligned with the Holy Spirit, there is one solution and one thing only, repent. 
This is the message for all of us, that we would have a repentant spirit, that we'd walk in humility. This is why I say the importance of going to the altar, every opportunity, get to the altar. Why? Because repentance is critical. It, repentance realigns our walk with God. Re, it, it corrects the course we're on. It gets us back in, in, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Church, it's five, minute to, five minutes to midnight. The coming of the Lord is here. I pray that we would walk in humility, walk in repentance, walk in obedience as we see the day approaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Jesus, I declare you are the amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want you to pray that prayer, church. Jesus, you are the amen. You have the final word. You are the final word. And all the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Lord, I come against lukewarmness and self-sufficiency. Lord, I see it in me. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me from lukewarmness and self-sufficiency. Help me to serve others and love God. Help me to serve others and love God. I pray this for the people of God. Lord, we would walk in repentance. We'd walk in humility. A humble and contrite spirit you will not despise. Lord, I pray that you would continue to send your Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, correct us, discipline us, rebuke us, help us to be aligned with the Word of God and aligned with the Holy Spirit so that we don't run here and there looking for experience, but instead we walk in obedience. Lord, I pray. Jesus, I pray that you would come into your house. Have your way in your house and in our lives. In Jesus' name.